1969. It was just two years after the summer of love and the height of hate Ashbury. It was the first year women were allowed to attend Ivy League schools, and the Beatles recorded their very last studio album. Richard Nixon announced he was pulling 25,000 American troops out of Vietnam, and 400,000 people showed up at a farm in New York for a music festival called Woodstock. This was also the same year as the Charles Manson murders, the trial of the Chicago Eight, and what the world thought was going to be the last episode of Star Trek. Fascinating. But the reason why we're here is because on July 16th, 1969, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration launched three men into space on spaceflight Apollo 11. And in about the same time that it takes to drive from New York to Los Angeles, Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon. But let's be real, there are a ton of videos on Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Apollo 11. In this video, in honor of the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing, I want to highlight 10 inspiring women who worked on the Apollo program, which was NASA's third human spaceflight program from 1963 to 1972, but the first, and so far only, program to land humans on the moon. We've all heard this. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One of the reasons this phrase is now famous, and I'd argue the main reason this phrase is so famous, outside of, of course, the inherent romantic poeticism and much talked about semantics, uh, it's because when Neil Armstrong first said these words, they were broadcast via NASA's Deep Space Network, a communications network between outer space and, I really wanna say inner space? Is that, is that a thing? Can we make that a thing? Between outer space and Earth, built by none other than Susan Finley. Susan was a part of an all-female team of coders led by Supervisor Macy Roberts, who decided to keep her team all ladies because it wasn't uncommon for male team members to straight up just not listen to their female colleagues because, you know, all of those uh, peer-reviewed studies about women being intellectually inferior that don't account for implicit social gender bias that's been around since the Bronze Age. But, you know, it happened back then, and well, now, sometimes. Margaret Hamilton was also a part of this all-female powerhouse led by Roberts, and a director at MIT's Instrumentation Lab responsible for the Software Engineering Division. Uh, Margaret is best known for coding the software that helped Apollo 11 land safely when there was a bit of a computer software overload. Take a listen. Program alarm. Looking good to us, over. 12.02. Bravo 2. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. Same alarm, and it appears to come up when we have a 1668 up. Roger, copy. Okay, for context. The year is 2019. Now, side note, I'm not sponsored by Apple, but I'm going to use them for my point. A computer can look like this, now. But just 20 years ago, it looked like this. I remember those. <laughs> 10 years before that, definitely had one of those too. It was like this. And 10 years before that, this. The Apple II with a whopping maximum capacity of 48 kilobytes of RAM. Now RAM is a computer's memory and helps determine how many programs you can capably run at one time, more or less. So for comparison, my computer today, which is years old itself, has 16 million? God, has 16 million kilobytes of RAM. 16 gigs of RAM, which is 16 million kilobytes of RAM. That is so insanely so much more. Okay, now that was in 1979, this 48 kilobytes of RAM, and that was maximum. So go back 10 years before that to 1969, and they're using just a sixth of that. A computer, they used a computer with four kilobytes of RAM to put a man on the moon. I can hardly edit this video on 16 gigs of RAM and, Impressive. So ultimately, all this to say, it's not surprising that they hit a 1201 error, which in modern day, I'm gonna to equate to that uh, little spinning wheel of death. 
But luckily, Margaret Hamilton was there to help override the system with the software she coded in a 1969 Control-Alt-Delete rescue of Buzz Aldrin and team, helping them to safely land back on Earth, or splash rather, since technically they landed in the Pacific, which was totally on purpose. Next up is Barbara Bobby Johnson, the first woman to graduate with a degree in engineering from the University of Illinois's, uh, Illinois's, that's weird, industrial engineering program. She was also the highest ranking female in her Apollo division in 1968 as the manager of mission requirements and integration, or evaluation, depending on the source. Bobby worked on the Apollo lunar landing program on elliptical orbits, uh, performance and design trajectories, resource management, and ran a group of over 100 engineers. 36 years after her contributions to the space program, an article in Astronomy quoted Bobby as saying, we should have, I thought, gone ahead and mapped the moon for future explorers. And we didn't do that. I think that was a mistake. Well, as it turns out, Apollo's twin sister Artemis is the namesake for NASA's spaceflight program that will pick up where Apollo left off with the help of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which as it happens, is helping to map the moon for future explorers. I'm rolling. Wait, okay, uh, Raquel, can you clap for me? Yeah, okay, that's gonna sync our mics. There's a spacecraft that's orbiting the moon right now. It's called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it was launched about 10 years ago, actually 10 years ago in June. The purpose is to map the moon, to map the moon, to look at the different properties of the surface, to plan for future missions. Well, next will be Artemis. Artemis is the next lunar manned lunar mission to the moon that hopefully will land a woman, the first woman, and another man uh, on the moon in 2024. My advisor is the principal investigator of an instrument that's on board that spacecraft. It's called Diviner, and it's a radiometer and basically that means that it's looking at the surface temperature of the moon. We care about that for future missions if, so we can decide where to send our, our astronauts, but also what kind of surface operations do you need to plan for? Because depending on what the temperature is at the surface, it's gonna dictate what you can and you can't do and when you can do certain things on the surface. So that's what the, our instrument does. What I think is one of the coolest things that Diviner has found is that some of the coldest places in the solar system are actually on the moon. Inside these craters. Wait, like the whole solar system, including yeah. like Col Pluto? Colder than the surface of Pluto. What? And this is because there's these craters at the poles oh, okay. that haven't seen sunlight for billions of years. So when the moon rotates, it doesn't rotate towards the sun very much, right? So sunlight is hitting, so it, it kind of just skims the surface. So it's, it's been really, really cold. And why we care about that, when you have a really cold place, that means you can trap volatiles. And when I mean by volatiles, I mean like water, water ice. So we think that there are water ice deposits inside of these craters, which is really important if we want to go explore the moon, we'd have water right there. So the, our instrument, like I said, it's looking at the temperature, it's in the infrared. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen um, an infrared camera. So this is essentially what we have um, orbiting the moon. So it, it's looking at my temperature. My fingers are kind of cold. Oh yeah. But my palm, let me see, can you? Uh, yeah, your, your nose, it's like there's a little bit of green. Yep, that's because I'm cold. Are, are my mouth should be very warm. I love the moon. So I, I also work on Mars. I study impact craters. So all these, you know, all these little holes it happens everywhere. So here on Earth, we've had impact craters on the moon because there's no atmosphere. They're beautifully preserved uh, at the surface. And, and, and that's actually one of the coolest things about studying the moon is that it's essentially a witness plate for everything that the Earth has experienced. But because there's no plate tectonics, there's no atmosphere, there's no water to erase the history, because here on Earth, that history gets erased, but it hasn't on the moon. So by studying the moon, we can also learn about what has happened to the Earth. And that's actually my favorite thing about studying the moon. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> that's spot on. Okay, that's another famous quote from the Apollo spaceflight missions, although what they really said is, uh, Houston, we've had a problem here. 
Enter Judith Love Cohen's abort guidance system, the backup system most famous for saving the lives of three astronauts on board Apollo 13 after an oxygen tank exploded on board, causing yet another oxygen tank on board to also fail. Judith was one of 1% of women in a class of 800 electrical engineering students at USC. And after her work on the Apollo missions, she went on to work on the ground station for the Hubble Space Telescope. In the 90s, she also wrote a really inspiring 11-book series encouraging girls to pursue careers in STEM. Also, fun fact, Judith Cohen happens to be Jack Black's mom. If the name Katherine Johnson already sounds familiar to you, I wouldn't be surprised. Aside from being the lead character in the award-winning 2016 biographical movie Hidden Figures, she is a rock star scientist who has been recognized with many awards herself, like the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015 and five separate years of the NASA Langley Research Center Special Achievement Award. She has buildings named after her, like the Katherine G. Johnson Computational Research Facility in Hampton, Virginia, and the Katherine Johnson Independent Verification and Validation Facility. Katherine started her career in the 50s in a segregated work environment until NASA took over and restructured the computing environments. There was still a ton of discrimination, but being an assertive and highly intelligent mathematician during her time at NASA helped Catherine to rise above a lot of the cultural barriers that held her back from advancing in the field as a woman, and especially a woman of color. But rise she did, to the role of aerospace technologist, until her retirement from NASA in 1986. Catherine Johnson was on the team that calculated Apollo 11's flight trajectory to the moon, and helped create a tracking system that ultimately helped Apollo 13 return safely to Earth after the mission was aborted. Time Magazine staff writer Olivia Waxman released an article earlier this month on Frances Poppy Northcutt, a math major from the University of Texas who got a job with NASA as a computer programmer right after graduating. Well, actually, the title was uh, Computress. Uh, Computress? No, no. Uh, which is both kind of adorable and patronizing at the same time. She worked on the Apollo 8, 11, and 13 missions, and being one of the only women in a room full of male engineers, she got a fair share of attention, as you might imagine, in both good ways and bad. Poppy wasn't a very political person at the time. She was more the kind of person who realized that the men in her office had turned one of the mission control cameras directly onto her, but decided not to get too distracted by the nonsense of boys and do her work. But she did find out at one point in her career that the men she was working with at the time were getting overtime pay, and she wasn't. So she decided to go to a rally and just see what it was about. And since she was the only female in her position at the time, she was naturally an object of media attention. Now, I mention this because that attention gave her a voice, which ended up shaping the rest of her career. So after this rally, she ended up doing this interview for Life magazine, where she was able to talk about equal pay for men and women in terms of her job. And she said, quote, If you write a computer program, it either works or it doesn't. There's no opportunity for anyone to be subjective. Of course, people were subjective, but her point was that computer programs don't care if you're a man or a woman. They work or they don't. And the person who gives you your salary shouldn't either. After the Apollo missions, she kept being awesome and contributing to society by getting a law degree and advocating for women's rights. Oh, and also, she has Lunar Crater named after her. Next up, we have Dorothy Lee. On the Apollo 11 mission, Dorothy Lee worked on the re-entry heat shields that protected the spacecraft upon re-entry. When she started at NASA, she was hired as a human computer, but she actually learned engineering on the job from the men in her group. Dorothy Lee worked her way up to the top division at NASA, and when she retired in 1987, it took 10 men to replace her. Next, there's LaRue Burbank, who designed the visual displays for real-time monitoring of spacecraft and mission control and co-authored the Apollo Experience Report in 1976 on information display systems and real-time data processing. There's also Anne Mayberry, who worked with the Apollo mission in its early days, and like Judith Cohen, also went on to work on the Hubble Space Telescope. And then there's another Anne, last but not least, we have number 10, Anne Dixon, an advocate for female astronauts who worked on special test equipment for Apollo, graduated with an engineering degree from UCLA, 
and applied to the Apollo mission after being inspired by President Kennedy's declaration in 1961 that the U.S. would send a man to the moon and back safely by the end of the decade. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Which we did. With the help of these 10 women, and of course, countless others. Happy 50th anniversary, Apollo 11.